hello, my name is Elias Redstone. I'm the Artistic Director of Photo 2022 International Festival of Photography here in Melbourne. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of Melbourne and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm delighted to introduce this uh, um, uh, talk for Photo Live, which is presented in partnership with Autograph in London. The series comprises of 10 online conversations between artists, photographers and curators from Australia and the UK that will explore ideas of identity and belonging in the context of human rights, representation and social justice. This programme highlights the importance of centering Black, Indigenous, feminist, queer and other marginalised voices in storytelling in photography. Photo Live is supported by the British Council and is presented as part of the UK Australia season 2021 to 22 which is a collaboration between the British Council and the Australian Government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So we are about to begin this session. Uh, for the audience, um, if you have any questions, please do leave them in the Q&A function at the bottom and we'll get to them. And if you'd like to use uh, access captions, please click close captions on your Zoom control and select subtitles. So this session is featuring the British artists Ope Laurie and Sean Lakin, Head Curator of International Art at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Ope is, uh, uh, works across visual arts, activism and academia, using lens-based media to investigate politics of difference, often in relation to cultural and sexual identity. Her research-led practice, which includes writing as well as image making, invites viewers to question power dynamics in both private and public spheres, routinely challenging societal stereotypes and myths. Their work is featured in the um, upcoming autograph exhibition opening tomorrow, Care, Contagion, Community, Self and Other. Sean, as I mentioned, is head curator of international art in the National Gallery of Australia. He was a gallery senior curator of photography between 2014 and 2020, and before that, gallery director of the Monash Gallery of Art. Previous positions include senior curator of photography at the Australian War Memorial, where he wrote the first history of Australian conflict for photography, and as well as curator of international art at NGA. Okay, so I will now leave it over to Sean to take over and I will see you both at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks Elias. Uh, hello everyone. Hi Ope. Um, I'm going to throw it to you in a minute but I'm going to acknowledge that I'm on uh, unceded Ngunnawal and Ngambri country uh, in southeastern Australia um, and I pay my respects to Ngunnawal and Ngambri elders past, present and emerging. I also want to acknowledge uh, all of the First Nations artists that I work with and um, my First Nations colleagues who do a lot of work uh, around the curatorial sort of offices at the National Gallery. And um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about my curatorial practice, but I thought first I might let the key sort of contributor to this conversation, the amazing artist Ope Lori uh, introduce uh, themselves from the UK. So Ope, if you'd like to just introduce yourself, say hi. Hi. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you, Elias. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, as well. So Photo Live and also Autograph. Uh, thank you to Renee and Mark Seeley for bringing you for us. So just thank you really everyone who, who's attending today. Um, it's really great to be on this or be part of this conversation uh, between Photo Live and Autograph. Um, as Sean said, um, I'm a British artist. Um, I work in the intersections of race and gender, specifically looking at how ideas of femininity link up to race, or should I say ideas of whiteness link up to femininity and how blackness links up to masculinity and really trying to undo some of those tropes. So hopefully when we're having this conversation today, we'll look at some of those earlier works um, and then actually speak about the work which I think got me to, got me to be part of this conversation, which is a work which is currently at Autograph, and which is quite a different work, even though it's quite intimate, but it's quite a different work and it's a work to do with my relationship with my father. So we'll talk about all of those things and I'm hoping that we can have a really good conversation um, 
with you, Sean. I hope we have a good conversation, an authentic and very intimate conversation. And then hopefully when we get to the end, we can invite questions from the audience too. Great. I'm really looking forward to the conversation as well, Lope. We met last week and had a really um, fun chat about your practice. And I'm really keen to talk about the work that you've uh, recently completed that's uh, shown, being shown at Autograph, uh, the work that uh, relates to, I guess, your relationship with your father. But just by way of, I guess, positioning myself um, before we sort of, I guess, go any further, my um, curatorial practice, uh, which is kind of developed, I guess, over a 20 year period, uh, tends to, I guess, concentrate on, um, I guess, feminist practice, queer practice, um, it tends to sort of focus on Australian material, um, histories of Australian practice. Uh, over the last probably six years, my practice has become increasingly collaborative to the extent that I probably don't really work in isolation anymore. I'm not interested in working in, in isolation. I work with uh, one colleague in particular, Anna O'Hare, who's a, a, another photography curator at the gallery, whose work is also very sort of invested in histories of feminist practice, photographic practice, and queer practice as well. Um, but actually, I've also been working really closely with um, First Nations colleagues on a range of projects at the gallery, uh, some photo specific, um, an exhibition that I did uh, called Resolution, which looked at sort of contemporary First Nations photo based, lens based sort of practice that was about three years ago. And maybe for me sort of most significantly, it's not a photographic project, but um, kind of working with all of my Indigenous and non-Indigenous colleagues on a kind of a recasting of the ways that we tell the history slash stories of uh, art in this continent, which have up until very recently at the National Gallery, as at most other national and state level kind of public institutions, tended to privilege the position of we colonisers. And so working with um, I guess a curatorium that was led by our First Nations colleagues, we at the gallery developed, a, uh, I guess, a kind of a methodology that um, sought to acknowledge, uh, I guess, the unceded sovereignty of uh, traditional owners of this place and the um, the fact that this is a place of culture uh, since time in memoriam and uh, also to acknowledge the really significant role that artistic production has had in the colonial project. So yeah, so I guess that sort of just gives you a bit of a sense of where my kind of practice is um, and maybe why I was invited in a way to come and chat with you because I do think there are some things while I'm um, obviously a privileged white man, um, I do think there might be some things, you know, that I've been thinking about with my work, um, particularly the collaborative stuff that I've been doing at the gallery that, that I think sort of feeds into, you know, some really central aspects of your practice. And so now let's, let's, let's look at, I guess, what it is that you're, you're doing. Um, and I think you've got a slideshow that you might be keen to share with us that yeah. you could maybe step through some work with. Yeah, I don't know whether we should start with the current work at Autograph or we get to that. What do you think? And I, reckon, just like... <laughs> I reckon let's get to that. I because I let's think let's that. let's look at some of the still, some of the photographic mm -hmm. um, work first. Okay, and you know what? You know what we're going to start with because you just um, opened with a line which um, is quite interesting. You know, you're a white privileged man, obviously. Yeah. So yeah. because of that, we will start with a work called a Beauty and Privilege series. But I think these ideas or concepts around privilege need to be further unpacked. But this is a, quite um, a specific work. Um, and this, so I'm gonna show my screen, so I hope everyone will be able to see, see my screen. I would say nod if you can see my screen, but I do yeah. see it. Thank you, Sean. Okay, so we'll start with the Beauty and Privilege series. Actually, yeah, we'll start with the Beauty and Privilege series. Um, so as I said, a lot of my work is around destabilizing, destabilizing ideas around the gaze and the traditional sort of gaze, how we understand the hierarchies of race and gender. Um, I'm only starting with this because of what Sean says. So we're talking about privilege. Now, this is quite an unusual work because it was the first work in which I'd used an open call methodology. 
And in this particular work, I was in two parts. The first part was about looking for black women. So again, we're trying to trouble the gaze, think about how black women have been historically, and you know, into even the now, um, quite hidden, quite invisible in media representations. So this was quite specific work where I asked, invited, put this call out in random spaces to get black women to pose in a way in which they felt they were seen as beautiful. So that was the first element. And then the second part was to put an open call out for drivers of very expensive cars. Um, I say expensive cars, but obviously you get what you get. So I do remember there was one time that um, I think a younger gentleman had come up and said, you know, I have, I'd like to be part of this, a uh, part of your project, but I have a, a Ford KA. So it's not necessarily an expensive car, but in his eyes, it was an expensive car. So what you have on your screen now is, it's made up of three parts. You've got the black woman who is posing in front of the cars. You've got the cars themselves and then the owners in the cars. Now you can also see a body of red text so the red text is actually how the owners describe their cars. It has nothing to do with the women themselves. So to be fair, this work was actually critiquing feminist theory, feminist film theory. But instead of think, using the white woman who takes up that role, it's actually the black woman who takes up this particular role. So it's a bit of a kind of a paradox. You know, it's about not being seen, but at the same time, you are seen. But when you are being seen, you're not really being spoken about. So all of these, um, I think we had about eight people who had responded. Um, so this one says, she has a great body. My baby will be together, uh, through a lot together. It's been seven years now, our sexy back. So that's the way that the white gentleman has spoken about his car. And I think as the project went on, it was quite interesting to think about one's assumptions. One's assumptions around, again, who would own these very expensive cars. You know, you might just think, okay, it's gonna be white wealthy men, but actually had a range of people who were responding. Um, in this one, we had um, a black woman, so two black women. Um, the woman in the car is actually called Ola, and she calls her car Ola. Um, so she says, big Ola, comfort, security, and freedom. So that's how, she, again, she describes the car, has nothing to do with the black woman in the front. So it was just a very interesting playoff. But I think, again, this work definitely opened up a lot of ideas around, um, like I said, privilege. Who does it belong to? What do we mean when we talk about privilege? White privilege and privilege as well. And exactly who, who owns that? And um, also these beauty ideals as well. You know, most of these women, and there's actually quite a range of women. And um, we had this white woman as well. I think actually those two are very, very good friends as well. So that works out quite nicely. So there's a lot of things which have been unpacked through this particular visual play of text, image, cars as well and cars signify quite a lot in fact there's a brilliant book which i just got out as it last week um i think it's by eunice um when he's a muslim man who wrote about the stereotypes of cars and how different communities identify with different cars and what that might mean so it's pretty loaded and here's another image as well and again you just didn't know who you're going to get responding to this open call. Here we had a Muslim man who just came out of the blue and saw us doing this work on the street and said, look, I want to participate. I've got this car. Do you want to do the shoot? And that was it. So he became part of this visual play as well. So the ideas of privilege, beauty, the visible, invisible have been really, really important. Ideas of trying to connect masculinity or trying to unpack this kind of stereotypical way in which masculinity aligns with blackness or whiteness aligns with femininity, especially as black and white women come together in one particular image. And some of this stems from my very earliest works, and I'm gonna try and get to that early work if I can. Actually, so, can, I just, can I just ask you yeah. a couple of questions? Yeah. One, you mentioned that the work sort of was in a way, a critique of feminist film theory. And like, that's an interesting sort of proposition because, um, I mean, I'm really interested in hearing a little bit more about that if, if you could, because I guess feminist film theory has kind of given us some tools that we have used, we being, I guess, people interested in photography and film, you know, some tools that we've used to interrogate the way that looking, you know, is kind of yeah. gendered. So could yeah. you tell us a little bit about how, I guess, Sorry, feminist me, film theory for yeah, you? Let me backtrack 
in why Amelia is actually using feminist right. forms to critique. Okay, so we're on the same page. Um, but again, using the ways that actually what we're seeing here is not really, it's nothing to do with women, it's just about the parading of the male consciousness. So that really is, yeah, so I suppose my background, I am a lens-based artist, but I move between video and photography as well. So definitely um, I've utilised quite a lot of that kind of theoretical framework to understand and to unpack those notions of the gaze. Um, if I actually go back to the very beginning, it's quite an important work. It's not something that I've, I've shown, but it's quite an important work. Um, so here we go. So it's called Moving Image 2009. So again, this is something, how I said it, I've, I'm kind of like in the middle of someone who uses video and photography. And this was one of the earliest works with my then partner about 10, 11 years ago, where I really started to understand those intersections of race and gender. So I'll play for you quickly and then I'll move into some other images. So it's quite an intimate piece, I and mean, it's a very intimate piece. And even when I look back at it now, in some of the ways that I measure whether an image is doing what it's doing is if it does something for me or if it does something for the viewer. So it still stirs that same sort of excitement and eroticism as it did about 11 years ago. Um, but it's quite significant. It was done during, I think, one of the first, well, not one of the first, there was a riot, a London riot in 2009. And in that riot, there's a way that People who were wearing hoodies or the young were kind of seen as obviously social deviants. You know, I was very cautious about being a black woman wearing anything that might be seen as remotely deviant because there'll be a way that you'd be aligned with those sorts of perpetrators. So I use quite a lot of codes in my work as well. So we know that things like hoodies are loaded, guns are loaded. And again, we know that the way that these sorts of codes are kind of attached to ideas around race. So that was my partner at the time. And I think for us, it was quite interesting how a lot of people always saw us as either, well, for myself, I always used to say that I was the most dominant partner or the masculine partner by proxy of my race. And they just assumed that she was just very passive and she must do certain things and she must dress in a certain way because of her race too. So they're both like victims and trapped within the parameters mm. of race. So that was just quite an important piece. Um, what I'll go on to now, because again, it's all about trying to challenge those notions of the gaze and what that might mean when it's just played out within a female relationship or a female body sort of encounter. So I will show this work because it's quite an important work. So this one's called, um, actually it's got a different title. So it's by the fashion photographer, Helmut Newton, and it's actually called Amica 1982. I think the VNA used to, or they do hold this image, but they've got a different title of the work. So for me, this is like a very typical traditional way in which the gaze have been constructed. Women are there to be looked at, men do the looking. And, you know, I always used to question this, you know, about what about female design? What does that look like? You know, if you speak to people, people say, well, you know, women don't look in that way. You guys don't have any sort of sexual urges in the same way that men do. So those are some of the kind of uh, generic conversations that would get involved in. So I was really interested in this image. I love the work of Helmut Newton. It might be controversial for some, but I'm very interested in different sorts of codes. And I think they're very seductive imagery. So I thought, you know what, what would it look like to have a, an all-female encounter? So I made up my own image or the appropriation of the image and it goes like this. So this is called After Newton 2012. Again, you can see my ex at the time and two other women. And actually I said two other women, four women, because it's quite interesting. Sometimes when people look at this image, they just assume it's a male body standing in front there for the other white women to look at, but actually it's not the case. And so again, it's just think about how women look at each other. Where does race come into it? What does it mean? 
Can the black body not be seen as dominant? Can it be seen as passive? Why is it read as being dominant? And so on and so forth. So really just really playing with that, inversing things, reappropriating things, really challenging what we see and questioning it. And then obviously I did another iteration, which I don't show as much, but I think the first one is, I think visually and aesthetically works really well. But again, you can have so many iterations of the same image. And I think that's what I'm really interested in, the multiple perspectives of any one thing, because then you'll have many questions and many solutions and it really just makes you think and question why we do things in certain ways. So I don't know if there's any questions at that point. And so I just want to say, what's really, I mean, I, I really love that first picture. It's fantastic. We spent some time talking about it last yeah. week and had a, a nice chat about the fact that Helmut Newton, yeah. you know, spent uh, his formative years in Australia. But what I really love about the way you talk about this picture is the way you acknowledge that you love Helmut Newton, you know, like yeah. it's so, um, I mean, it is easy to not love Helmut Newton, you know, because it, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's highly possible to read Newton as a misogynist, you know, as his pictures as misogynist. But I love the way that you kind of acknowledge, I, I, and I do too, like I'm not his main audience at all, but I, I do find his, his photographs quite titillating in a way. Uh, and I'm not just, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily find the same thing, but there is definitely something in Newton that, that I find really attractive and what I love about your account of this photograph is the way that you acknowledge that you love Newton so there is kind of like this really complex kind of network of desire lines that sort of work in in the work you know you kind of becoming Newton because you're making the picture you know you becoming the model because you're standing with your back to us your friends looking at you you know just it's it's a really kind of interesting ambivalent sort of picture that's not straightforward. Yeah, and I like that word ambivalence. I think, you know, a lot of my work, at least my early works, it's around taboo. It's around the things that we don't really want to talk about, but they're there. It's around the two sides of human psychology or people, the nature of people. So I know when we'll speak about the latter work, the work an autograph, you know, I referred to the pedagogy of the oppressed by Paolo Freire. But again, it's that duality of people. We might not want to say it, but it's always going to be there. And that's what I'm trying to do with my work. You know, if you're feeling that way, then it's good because it means the work is, is working. It's doing something. You might be uncomfortable with it, but it's about questioning why you're uncomfortable with it. And that's what I hope some of the works do. So this is quite important. I think it's a, it's, it's a massive piece of work. Um, and I'm wondering whether we might just move off from this and just maybe go to something that does that thing that kind of ambivalence that kind of uncomfortability so we'll move slightly out we'll come back to the photographic images but maybe we'll just go into a, a, a video book called i want me some brown sugar because i think it does the same thing and for me this is a work which kind of moved away from just stereotypical binary structures and again is trying to look at multiplicity of understandings around difference um, so this work and I hope there's no one who's under the age of 18 in the audience. Mm -hmm. If so, please look away. Um, so this work is around, is about online pornography. Uh, there we go, okay. So I'm gonna play it. So I'll talk through it as, as it's playing. Um, it's an eight screen video installation. All of those screens are about 60 inches high or whatever you want to call it, 60 inch TV monitors. Now, again, because, you know, a lot of my work is always slowed down. So I do have that, that love with lens-based photography. So I always try and slow down my images as much as possible. So at that time, I actually wanted to do a work which was referencing online pornography, or should I say the comments that people were making around racial dialogues within porn. So what I had done, I had, for the last, I think over about two, three months, I had schooled <laughs> porn sites and porn sites of different categories, whether it was straight sex, whether it was um, 
gay sex, lesbian sex, interracial sex. So anywhere that there was kind of like an interracial play with sex, I would document what people had said about these things. So the text you can kind of see at the very bottom is just what people have spoken about. Again, in the privacy of their own houses, people make these comments about race. And actually it's the same conversations we are having today when people talk about online racism, when they talk about trying to understand the world of online racism in sports, football, and we're having quite big conversations over here in the UK around this very same premise. It's about what people say when they're not in the spotlight. So this is what I was doing in this particular work. You can see, again, four white bodies, four black bodies. You have sitters, you have walkers, you have people who are slightly nude, people who are dressed. And I love that kind of interplay with the multiple ways, multiple ways of understanding difference. You know, nothing is fixed. And I think this idea of um, complexity, difference, becoming, is so important in my work. Because again, becoming can be understood over time. And I think, again, we'll speak about that when we show the, one of the final pieces, which is that autograph. Um, but this opened up such a, a I not say a big can of words, but I'll give you one example. When we were doing the talk for this um, particular work, there was a black gentleman who had said that he really loved it and he thought it was amazing. He couldn't articulate why he loved it, but he really thought it was amazing. Now what has happened is that a few, and I would say it's quite interesting, a few black women have said to him, oh, I find it really offensive that you found that, that you felt comfortable enough to say that this is a really good work that you really enjoy. And I thought at that point, this is where, you know, I knew that the work was working because why wouldn't he say that? You know, this is not specifically, this work does not belong to anyone. Mm. You know, we're talking about desire, we're talking about innate things that people don't want to talk about. So it was quite an interesting conversation. And I think in terms of where I place myself as an artist, I don't think I fully belong in any particular space. However, I know that I work within the areas of race. I know I work within the areas of homoeroticism, but it's not necessarily just about sexual orientation in that way. It's always about people and encountered people and bodies. So I'll leave that one there. Um, just a few um, other works, like I said, in terms of like the photographic imagery. imagery. So again, I'm, I like the seductive kind of looks of things. <laughs> Um, again, really thinking about that relationship with black and white women. So that was always like, one of my visual methodologies. You know, thinking about how those two bodies are always seen within representations, whether it's in films, whether it's just an, an encounter on the street, what happens and how do we understand race and gender? How does it get mapped out in both bodies? This was a couple at the time. Um, obviously, they, they split up. Um, but again, just really playing with those ideas of being seen, not being seen, who holds the power and so on and so forth. Um, that was, what I should say is that, you know, with much artwork, with much thinking, much writing, you know, your, your ideas and ideals change over time. And in the initial stages of my practice, it was always about making sure that the black community was being seen, she was being visible. But at the same time, I understood that that came with kind of, um, What's the word I'm looking for? There was also something that was also happening to the white women in doing that, right? Because in trying to elevate oneself or elevate a particular ideal, it means that something else has to give. So I kind of understood that both of us were trapped in these different ways. It wasn't just about the black women, it was also about the white women, or whether you call it the dark skinned women and the light skinned women. You know, we're both trapped in this pool of representation. And that's for me where I started to question representation in itself. It's not about us. It's not about our bodies in that way. So it's about how do you do away with some of those things that we've learned and understood, like the trappings of race and gender. So again, this is where someone like Paolo Freire really comes, is such an important person in my work, in terms of the thinking, in terms of really understanding the oppression. You know, even if you're switching poles, it doesn't really do anything. What is it achieving? And that's why it features in this work um, at Autograph. Um, and I didn't know it was going to feature in that work in Autograph in the way it has done. And we'll get to that when we show that particular piece. 
So there's, I, I just think that there's one statement that you made there that I really love. Um, and it's just, it, to me, it kind of really goes to the heart of a lot of what you seem to be sort of focusing on and, and trying to enact. And that, that statement was, you know, this work doesn't necessarily belong to anyone. And um, actually, you know, that's a, that's a really compelling thing to say about work that is sort of deeply concerned with power relations. And, um, you know, again, like the way you were talking about the work that you were just showing us, um, how you kind of acknowledged at one point that power uh, has a certain limit. And so once power is kind of redistributed, you know, someone loses power. And, and, and yes. at the same time, you kind of then sort of acknowledge, well, it's, it, it's not necessarily about power. It's just about a kind of a different way of, I guess, sort of, I guess, understanding agency. And um, yeah, so, I, so I think that this is really compelling for me that, that your, that your project is, um, that your project is so open. And I love the way that with um, that with beauty and privilege, you know, you from like 2011, you know, we're building a community, you know, like by inviting people to come in with their cars, by inviting, you know, like there was this community building project that at the same time, you know, uh, was being sort of produced alongside work, which was deeply intimate, you know, images of you and your partner, images which um, which went to your own sort of deeply held sort of, you know, uh, desires and pleasures. And, and then, you know, the deeply held design, desires and pleasures that people might express uh, in the safety of their own homes looking at online porn. There's this really interesting kind of network, you know, that goes to sort of like public spaces and community building, but also acknowledging sort of the, the power of, I guess, like that intimate experience such that no one owns anything, like it's all ours, like it's a deeply kind of open sort of practice. And um, I don't know if I've got, if there's a question there or if there's something that you wanted to respond to. I know it does, yep. I think it's a good observation what you've just done. And that, again, there's just so many facets to that. But you know, I think again, due to the opportunity that Autograph has given me as well, and I know that, you know the life of an artist goes ups and downs, and sometimes you can you know in a space where you want to make a lot of work, and there's times when you just don't have that capacity to do so. But again, being the Autograph show has been really, really useful for myself. And again, we will speak about some things which have manifested or happened during that process. But to speak to what you just said, I'm actually about to make a series of images and it is about that in terms of, I will be working with people. I always see people as my tools. I mean, that's one thing I'll say, people are my tools. And there's a work which I'm about to make, which is called um, seeing you at, at the level in which you see me. So again, it's quite an intimate one, but again, it doesn't belong to anyone. And what I should say is that in the last couple of weeks, last couple of months, I've moved to, a different area in London, um, for Bromley, for anyone who knows, maybe Elias knows, he's sitting in the audience. Um, and I have a park next to me. And every Sunday, I always go to the park, it's my normal practice. I always go there about eight o'clock in the, in the morning and I walk around with all the dog walkers, all the people who are jogging. And what I've started to know, and it's so interesting, the amount of people who, you would ex who just say hello to you, there'll be people that you wouldn't expect who will say hello to you. There'll be people who you will think, oh my gosh, well, have they said hello? Because, oh, I will see a fellow black person think, oh my gosh, they're never gonna say hello to me. But then they'll say hello. I'll see an old white man and I'll say, oh my gosh, he's never gonna say hello to me because of our differences in race and gender and age. And then he'll say hello. So it's just so interesting to see that human encounter. And you can just never assume that you're gonna get that reaction given who that person is. So it's almost like you're seeing people on a different level beyond the surface. It's almost like well, our eyes are meeting, but we're not meeting because of race. We're not meeting because of gender. We're meeting because I see you. And that's just something mm. I don't know why, but I thought that's really important to mm. what you just said and also how I see my practice. So I don't know if it's worth us going to, you know, it's going to be about 40 minutes in. Should we go into just the work at Autograph? I think so, because we've, we've probably only got about 10 minutes left. So okay. I reckon we should move on to the amazing work that, you've, that you're showing at Autograph. Okay, so there's two pieces. Um, and when this was commissioned, there's hopefully people have uh, gone to the Autograph website. When it was commissioned, it was during the pandemic. 
uh, sorry, during the first year of the pandemic, so in 2020, and it was just so beautiful for Osprof to have reached out at that point, and they commissioned 10 artists to make this work, responding in a way to what was going on at that time. Uh, for that particular commission, I'd always had this to, had in mind to do this particular work, so it's works with my father. I'm going to play it first, and then I'll just speak a little bit about it. Education, Education is suffering, suffering from narration, corrected and decoded the contents of his narration and alienated which attached from the, the sonority. Para means for Brazil. Them into containers, into receptacles to be built. Our depositories and a teacher is a depositor in which a student's not which a student's patiently receive a depositor. Become collectors or cataloguers of the things they restore. In which the lack of creativity, transformation, and knowledge in the only thinking. Okay. It's actually quite a long piece. It's about 40 minutes in duration. And basically, it's a piece around the books that my father and I have read over time. And during the pandemic, I went back to my family house for 14 years and I spent a lot of time in my dad's library. And what was so interesting is that over the years, and you can maybe see maybe a little bit of my book collection here that my dad and me have read some of the same books. It's in our same collections. And the pedagogy of the press, we both had the same books as well. So in fact, at that point, I remember writing something in that book you can see at, at the first part, where it's about really being thankful for my father and the fact that we're coming on the same journey. And I never used to think that at the time. When I was younger, you know, I was so against reading or so against everything. So. For us to bond in this way is so important. So obviously what you can see here is me reading both of our copies, um, reading my copy of the same chapter in Paolo Freire's Pedagogy in the Press, and I read his copy. And what I'm reading are just the lines and annotations as we've both obviously held these books within our lifetimes. And I say lifetimes because it is very important um, sadly, my dad passed away three months ago. And it's in some ways when I was having interviews with the amazing Campbell X, um, filmmaker, and also Renan Messiah as well, one of the things I'd said is that this work is quite prophetic. It's the sort of work you only make when a parent has passed away. And obviously he passed away and, you know, he gave me his blessing to make this work. You know, he passed away out of the blue but he gave me this blessing to make the work. So in some ways, it's almost like it was going to happen. This was a conversation that was going to happen and this was gonna happen. And this is why this work is so significant. Even a part like this, if you can see in the screen now, when I was doing his book, um, reading of his book, it took me seven minutes to go through all of his annotations and all of his marks. The same chapter takes me 14 minutes. So if you can understand that, even that understanding of knowledge for me, over time, you can see the differences. And so the reason why it's absent is because, you know, I've finished reading his copy. So for me, it's quite significant. And this idea about identity, becoming him, him becoming me, his legacies, his teachings, knowledge, how does that, how does that live on? All of those questions come into this work. Um, so it's quite a different work. It is still very intimate, but it's just that it's an intimate relationship with father and daughter as opposed to the other types of intimate relationships that I've explored through my work. 
So you've still got the same sort of setups in terms of like the staging, you know, you've got a traditional kind of um, reclining figure, but obviously it's a black woman, a black lesbian woman, who is also wearing what we call nagbara. So that's like a male um, garment, typically worn by men in Nigeria. And again, what's quite interesting um, in the last couple of days, because um, I'm actually going to the funeral next week in Nigeria, um, we've been doing, trying to get all the stuff ready and all the clothes ready. And um, interesting, I said, oh, which dress do you want to wear? I'm thinking, I don't wear dresses anymore. <laughs> so it's quite interesting work just to really, it's not necessarily about gender in that way, but I know that those tropes will be present in this work because of that becoming my father as opposed to maybe becoming my mother or another feminine figure. So can we, can we exact, I, I, I'm really conscious of the time, but I just want to talk a little bit more about this work, which I just find so fascinating. I really, you know, we spoke about this work last week and I, I think I could talk about it with you for hours and hours. It's a really amazing work, but could you maybe, like, so the thing about the book is, that the pedagogy of the oppressed, I guess, for people like of your father's generation, you know, colonized subjects, uh, people living in colonized places, that book sort of made an argument for rethinking the way that education worked to the extent that the learner, you know, um, needs to be empowered as a sort of a creative part of the sort of educative or pedagogic process. How do you think? I don't want to sort of sort of steamroll this conversation into a into a place where it doesn't need to go. But how do you think like your shared interest, that is yours and your father's shared interest in this book, um, I guess kind of is, is is of sort of significance now, you know, in terms of making this work now. You know, the work's about you and your father, but the work's also about this, this text that, you know, for both of you, both of different generations, you know, has yeah. has kind of held significance. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of my work is about raising consciousness. It's about getting people to think. One of the things my dad always said is that knowledge is not there to be stored, it's to be shared. And Paulo Freire was probably one of many different types of readers and thinkers that my dad read. You know, he was a trained gynecologist, but he has a wealth of, you know, different books where he's looked at different geographical locations, whether it's about spiritualism, he's read a breadth of these things. So for me, it was always about what you could do for others. It was always about how do you teach others to, you know, or liberate others. And that was actually part of a lot of his work, even beyond his, his um, professional um, mm. career. He was someone who was the chief of what we call the warrior community of Nigerians over here in the UK. So it was always about serving. And this is something which we both share in terms of what I do outside of my artistic practice. I also was the founder of PILA, so pre mission Learning in Action, which is a learning um, and arts consultancy. So we're dealing with equality, diversity, inclusion, but using the visual arts. So that thread is there. And even beyond the wonderful Palo Freire saying it, these are the things that my dad constantly told us 30 years ago, 35 years ago, it was always something that was drummed in. So much so, just like in just one minute, there's another piece which is shown with this, which is called I Becoming You. And even though I'll, I'll show part of it, and I'll start with very soon. Physically, they grow mentally, they grow spiritually. In Africa and different parts of the world, hardworking, the family is far more extensive because it's that spirit of family. togetherness. You have the father, the grandfather, the great grandfather, the great 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 grandmother, Norris, so on and so forth. What did to say? All that people with a higher knowledge wanted to say. Man cannot live by sweat alone. Where we Bible We need to to you not shake black black. The was was sweat worship the devil. Where we are in the 
so I had to share that. So what you can see is a re <laughs> a retelling of a video that I'd made in 2007, and I've just literally redone that particular piece. But in it, and unfortunately, if you can't hear, apologies. And um, but in it, these are some of the things that my dad would constantly teach us. You know, think about okay, well, how you can be independent, think like the masses, but at the same time, don't think like the masses. You know, how do you liberate yourself? What is consciousness? What is oppression? And for me, he was a, a very important person who really said, you know, there's no limitations. You know, he'd always call himself a feminist. And I always used to laugh at it. I was like, Daddy, how are you a feminist? But we would laugh constantly about it. So all of those things are encapsulating some of those teachings. And I think it's, it's that element of teaching, which is something that we definitely both share. It's about how we work with people. And so the work, both of these uh, works are being presented uh, now, yeah. very soon. How do you, so there's this kind of really interesting family connection, uh, you know, interest in legacies, interest in being part of a diaspora, interested in, I guess, a kind of, you know, decolonizing sort of methodology as it's found in the work of people like um, Paolo Freire. But how do you see the work kind of functioning right now? Like, what, what are you, what are you thinking people looking at this work now at Autograph um, might sort of get from it, do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, when the brief went out, it was about to really deal with what was happening at the time. So we're talking about the start of the pandemic. We're talking about that month when we had the police brutality in the US. We had what happened with George Floyd happening, and that obviously was a global issue. We had issues with our educational system in terms of A-levels and GCSEs being scrapped. And, you know, how that really unearthed a lot of inequalities within the educational system. So there are so many things that have been happening, as you will know, in the last couple of years. And, you know, people are feeling trapped and frustrated. So really, this work is about how do you do that? How do you gain some sort of power in this really terrible situation? And I think for me, that gives what well, gives me a lot of freedom, a lot of peace, knowing that actually there's other things that I can do. There's a different way that I need to think to really address some of these situations. So I'm hoping that that's what this work will do. I think the fact that, you know, we are with reference in Palo Freire, and I think such, again, like I say, is such a thing to work, just to understand how oppression works, just to understand how power works. Those who seem to be in those powerful positions, what we can do to really challenge that system. and know that actually those things are, it's internal as well as being external. We can make those differences as well. So I hope that's what people will get from that work. And, you know, it is a homage to my dad. So um, it will be interesting tomorrow when I see it for the first time because I haven't actually seen or even heard his voice in that way. Mm. Uh, so it will be very interesting. Mm. Congratulations. It's really, it's, you know, I, I really wish I could see it. It looks, it looks like beautiful work. It really does look like a beautiful project and I'm mm. so so sorry we're on the other side of the world and missing the exhibition but it has yeah. been an absolute delight hearing you talk through it and understanding your practice in more more detail. So I've obviously come on to say that we have run out of time but just really wanted to thank you both for the conversation this evening and the beautiful introduction to your work, Ope and Sean, always a delight to um, hear you in conversation with artists and about your own, uh, about your own practice. Um, so we are just about to wrap up. Uh, for anyone watching, uh, just a reminder, that we'll be back next week with the artists Dean Cross and Sylvia Rossi, and really looking forward to their conversations. A uh, big thank you both to you, Sean and Ope, for your conversations and to the team at Autograph, Mark, Renee, Bindi, et cetera, over there, um, Lindsay on our side, and um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Thank you very much. Have a good day over there. Thanks, Ope. Thanks, Elias. See you later, Sean. Bye. See, see, you. Uh, see you soon. Good luck in Nigeria as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to meeting you. Yes. That'd be <laughs> lovely. Love the shout Bye. out to Tom Lee earlier. Yeah. See you. Bye. Have a good night.